uh, here. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Good evening. My name is Todd Hornback. I am privileged to be the chair of the White Tank Mountains Conservancy Board of Directors and uh, also your uh, host for this evening, moderator, uh, if you will. And it's my privilege to welcome all of you to the White Tank Mountains Regional Connectivity Initiative speaker series hosted, of course, by the White Tank Mountains Conservancy in partnership with Central Arizona Conservation Alliance and made possible by the support of the Nina Mesa Pulliam Charitable Trust. Many of you have been with us throughout the series, but perhaps some of you are joining us this evening for the first time. So just a kind of a brief overview. The White Tank Mountains are really at a critical stage uh, in their history. Uh, as they stand in the path of one of the fastest growing metro areas in the nation. And of course, the survival of this outstanding area of natural beauty could be in jeopardy unless steps are taken to ensure the natural wildlife corridors that animals rely upon for forage, migration, and genetic diversity are not cut off. And so to prevent this from happening, the White Tank Mountains uh, Conservancy has launched a collaborative effort called the White Tank Mountains Conservancy Regional Connectivity Initiative, as well as a collection of digital stories with interactive maps that we call story maps that provide an in-depth look at why sustaining the natural heritage of the White Tank regions is so critical. So we're in the third of our uh, three-part series. Uh, and if you weren't with us for the first two sessions, session one was called uh, What's at Stake? White Tank Mountains, a Sonoran Desert Legacy. And we had a myriad experts uh, uh, in, uh, in the Sonoran uh, Desert and um, biodiversity uh, and ecosystems present uh, on uh, what's at stake and, and what is uh, really in and around this uh, glorious uh, region. Session two was uh, called Booming Cities, Tale of an Urban Expansion in Western Maricopa County where we brought together uh, regional planners and business leaders uh, to talk about essentially the booming population growth that has been occurring and, and will continue uh, well into the future. And so as you can imagine, uh, tonight's session is really about the confluence of those two things. And we're calling it a connectivity vision, protecting place and passage for wildlife and people. And so tonight's session will be focused on envisioning a more connected world for people and wildlife. And we hope to set forth a compelling vision for ecologically sustainable desert cities that integrate the natural and built environment to harness ecosystem services that promote a high quality of life, economic opportunity, and conservation of rich natural history in the region. So again, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, there's lots of introductions to do and we'll do them along the way. I just wanna point out a couple of folks right at the outset. Uh, Les Myers, the executive director of the White Tank Mountains Conservancy is here and of course uh, a, a co-host. And Anya, and I'm gonna stop there, Anya Q, uh, if that's okay. Uh, I don't wanna take an attempt at your last name, but Anya from CASCA, the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance is also here this evening, so welcome to you both. We're also very privileged to have uh, two uh, important leaders in our region, uh, Mayor um, Orsborn and, and Mayor Hall from Buckeye and Surprise respectively, and I'll do a more proper uh, introduction in a moment. So uh, just like the, the last couple of uh, sessions, we have uh, a host of wonderful, well-informed experts. Uh, we intend to uh, make this a conversation, although you know difficult in a virtual environment. I do encourage you to uh, raise your hand uh, and put your questions and comments in the chat. There's no need to wait until the end. Uh, as a matter of fact, we're gonna in we intend to have a little dialogue uh, after each uh, speaker. So don't hesitate to uh, raise your hand uh, virtually, uh, or perhaps uh, drop your question in the chat. We'll be monitoring those. And again, we'd like to make this uh, as interactive as, as possible. So before I introduce our mayors, I just wanna um, um, sort of tee up again our conversation, what I'm calling a, an opening perspective. 
And uh, we're going to do a quick little share screen here that I think Jamie's going to help with. Great. So when uh, so uh, you know, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm very privileged to serve on the board of directors of the White Tank Mountains Conservancy. But my day job is working in the real estate development world uh, with DMB Community Life and a host of others throughout uh, Arizona, Colorado, uh, Texas, and and California. And, and was very privileged to be on the ground floor, uh, so to speak, of the Verado Community uh, Development. In fact, uh, my family and I lived there for 16 years, and so. Uh, we have a personal relationship uh, to this region, to these uh, mountains that, uh, like all of you, I'm guessing is, is a profound one. Uh, but there's also a professional interest, and I would like to just share a little bit of what led to the creation of the Conservancy, really from a real estate developments uh, uh, perspective, um, because I think it's important as we think about the confluence of population growth and the protection of natural open space uh, that we have uh, an, an open, candid dialogue about uh, the development uh, of, of our region. And so if you could go to the next slide, Jamie, I just want to kind of tee up our conversation as, as we move uh, um, to introduce the mayors for their vision for the region uh, in a moment. I want to just tell a brief little story about how we at DMB kind of got into this. So. The first thing is, you know, uh, we're a little frustrated with the, you know, the bipolarization of the conversation. Uh, so our first kind of um, tenet in our foundation uh, for how we think about these things is that population growth and protecting our environment are they're not mutually exclusive. And unfortunately, we often reduce the conversation to just that. You're either, you know, for the protection of the environment or you're pro-growth uh, and, and don't care. Uh, the reality is, as we'll discuss throughout the evening, uh, and especially in Arizona, we've seen um, numerous examples where that's just not the case, where, as I've said from the beginning, we can have our cake and eat it too, if we do it thoughtfully and carefully, and if we uh, do it uh, together. Uh, which led to this other idea that, you know, that heretofore conservation was largely thought about as it's just sort of the right thing to do. It's kind of like altruism, but what we're learning more and more, of course, is that preserving natural ecosystems and protecting wildlife is actually in our self-interest. Uh, and, and you all know, I'm sure, that there's been a, a ton of research on the topic that sort of proves out uh, the point that it is in fact in our interest to recreate, uh, to be outdoors, uh, nature has a direct effect on the chemicals of the brain, and I could go on and on, but uh, it is, um, it's, it's a selfish thing to do, uh, which is an important thing to discuss, because when we're trying to move mountains and make change, uh, it's important that we recognize um, people's self-interest in, in, in the initiative, uh, which leads to this other thought that there's an increasing market demand for outdoor recreation and access. Uh, to nature and it's only growing. And so the call for open space, the call for preservation, uh, the call for conservation and the integration of natural systems into our built environment will only grow, which leads uh, me and others like me to realize that there's a real uh, opportunity here. And in fact, uh, there is what I would call a new real estate play. Uh, and yes, it does pencil. And again, you can, you can do all of these things uh, and make your numbers work if they're done carefully and, and thoughtfully and collaboration with others. And, and increasingly, we have a whole new set of tools uh, in order to do that, uh, inclusive of all of the products and services coming out of the White Tank Mountains Conservancy, as well as CASCA uh, and, and our local uh, municipalities, their general plans, uh, the best practice guide that Buckeye has recently launched around uh, conservation, story maps, uh, and all of these things are translating into uh, a, um, a readiness and a capacity uh, for us to meet the challenges of the day, which are, uh, you know, how do we protect what's beautiful about our beloved Sonoran Desert uh, and meet the demands of the population growth 
at the same time. And we know that it works. And I just pulled a few examples, uh, maybe a little difficult to see, but I'll just describe them to you. So the one on the far left is where our story started, which is in DC Ranch. Uh, DC Ranch, as um, many know, is at the base of the McDowell Mountains in, in Scottsdale uh, and actually gave rise uh, in, in large part uh, to the McDowell Sonoran Preserve and, and uh, DMB, the developer of DC Ranch, um, actually on a handshake and a smile with the then Mayor Herb Drinkwater, uh, struck a deal to protect um, half of, of their property. Uh, and to this day, it still um, is, is protected and preserved and gave rise to the extraordinary efforts that are now being led at the McDowell Sonoran Conservancy. And so uh, preservation is in our DNA, uh, ironically, uh, at, even as uh, developers. And the picture that's uh, directly to the right of DC Ranch is Silverleaf, where the story continued. Uh, and it's a little difficult to see here, but we're kind of proud of this photo because one of the things that Drew, the D and DMB likes to talk about is it's critically important that our communities sit quietly upon the land. Uh, the land was there before all of us, uh, and it's our job to nurture it and build a legacy for people to enjoy for generations uh, to come. And so Silverleaf is a number, uh, another example of of, uh, of how that confluence was well managed. The next picture over is actually Mech Park uh, in Verado, uh, which is right in the heart of the community. Uh, literally tens of thousands of people will be able to walk to this facility and then make their way out onto a trail system that will take them all the way to Skyline Regional Park or into Maricopa County Regional Park. And so from their driveways, they'll be able to access literally hundreds of miles uh, of trails and open space. And uh, to the extent that we're successful in our efforts at the White Tank Mountains Conservancy, uh, a pristine natural um, habitat and uh, ecosystem. But it's not just here in Arizona. Lastly, this is a project that we worked on a little bit in, uh, in Colorado. This is called uh, Backcountry, the picture on the right. Uh, this is a real, real photograph. Uh, and the reason I chose this, this is done by Shea Holmes in Colorado. Uh, just behind them was supposed to be the 18th fairway and the 18th hole right at the bottom of the clubhouse. And as a matter of fact, Jack Nicholas himself had already designed uh, that golf course and it was going in. And at the 11th hour, the developer of Backcountry decided, we think we could realize the same real estate value. We could sell the same view premiums and essentially make this project pencil by just having all of that become open space and natural systems for wildlife and passage of uh, um, animals and, and people. Uh, and they did exactly that. And the vice president of Shea Holmes told me himself uh, that we did in fact realize uh, the same uh, level of financial success. Uh, and we were able to preserve um, acres and acres of open space, uh, uh, not, not, no, no knock on golf, uh, but just a great example of how uh, you know you you can manage uh, the um, protection of the open spaces and connectivity and uh, outdoor recreation uh, for wildlife and and, and people, uh, and at the same time develop your communities in a thoughtful way that meets the demand uh, of of uh, of the growing population. So uh, with all of that said, uh, it's my real uh, privilege to introduce you to our first uh, speakers this evening. And uh, from the city of Buckeye, I would like you to join me in welcoming uh, Mayor Eric Orsborn. Uh, Eric was elected mayor in 2020 after serving on the city council as Di District 6 representative, which is Verado's, just saying, uh, from 2010 until till 2020. Uh, Mayor Orsborn has a Bachelor of Science degree in Construction Management from ASU, go Devils. There's other universities here, but anyway. Uh, he is also the owner of uh, OCM, a construction and maintenance company based in Buckeye, uh, and is an Arizona native, uh, which is increasingly rare, and a member of a variety of organizations, including uh, one that I'm uh, very fond of as we're colleagues over at Luke Air Force Base and Blue Blazer uh, Squadron at Fighter Country Partnership, 
as well as a variety of committees at MAG and economic development and a bunch of other things. And he has a beautiful family, his wife, Tina, and uh, their daughter and son, uh, Emma and Jack, live in the community of Verado. So Mayor Orsborn, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you and thanks for the introduction. And um, and really, Todd, you stole all my thunder. So basically, I'm just going <laughs> to say ditto to everything you said. And uh, and we're off to the races. Well, I've, I've got, um, I think you all told me I have seven minutes and I've got about 30 minutes worth of notes and slides. So I'm going to jump right on into it and share a screen. And you can tell me if you're able to see uh, the screen. Is that coming up to where you can all see it? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, well, good evening. It's it's great to be here with so many uh, influential people who share the same vision as the Buckeye City Council <clears throat> in regards to integrating the natural beauty of the Sonoran Desert with, um, in our case, our city's tremendous growth. And we have in common uh, a future that continues to blend the, the natural ecosystem that surrounds our communities with the economic opportunities that are gonna enhance uh, our quality of life. <clears throat> so if I, hey, I can make this work, this is gonna work out just fine. Uh, and uh, I, I didn't skip to this slide in time, but take, take a look, if you will, the, the, the picture that is here and, um, and that uh, sea of tile roofs. And I'm gonna come back to that at the end. Uh, and that's just a small portion of, of the city of Buckeye. For, um, for Buckeye, our, uh, the groundwork for our goal really began a long time ago when we entered into a lease with BLM for Skyline Regional Park uh, on the south end of the Waitake Mountains. And at that time, Buckeye's population was a small percentage of what it is today. Uh, that that uh, property required a massive cleanup effort and dedicated city staff and volunteers made that happen and, and helped to turn that park into what it is today. It's a, a true destination for the West Valley. Uh, we have in the last year over 425,000 visitors that went to Skyline Regional Park. Um, and about five years ago, we started updating our general plan, Imagine Buckeye 2040. The Imagine Buckeye was uh, based on stewardship that connected natural areas, wildlife corridors, waterways, utilities, new residential and commercial development. And our residents shared the passion and the vision that we had in the general plan. It was approved by nearly 80% of the voters in 2018. <clears throat> it was also the Arizona Planning Association's best uh, general plan award um, for that, that following year. I'm, I'm, uh, I think I'm required by Matrix Group to, to say that every time I talk about the, the general plan. Uh, in 2019, um, the Buckeye City Council approved our transportation master plan, which is a component of the, um, the, master, the uh, general plan. And that guided where our transportation network happens. And important for this conversation, uh, it, it uh, showed where wildlife crossings and, and uh, these corridors that we're talking about are incorporating into the planning of these uh, networks and, and the streets and uh, transit system network. <clears throat> the, uh, in addition, the Buckeye City Council Recently, I'm, I, I feel like a piano player back here. I'm, uh, I'm clicking through notes and then I'm also clicking through these slides. And I don't know if that shows on that side, but I feel like I'm playing drums or piano or some kind of instrument back in the side over here. Uh, <clears throat> the Buckeye City Council recently approved the Wildlife Corridor Best Practice Guide uh, earlier this year. And that guide focuses on parks, trails and open space, economic development, property values and public health. And we know that residential properties with easy or direct access to nature have a higher property value up to 20% uh, higher and are considered, it's considered a key benefit when businesses are looking to relocate. In fact, we've had several 
businesses that uh, key in on that specifically and, and what their employees are going to do or what they're going to do um, for recreation in the Buckeye area. Um, our master planned communities follow uh, strict policies that conserve natural resources, use low impact designs that improve water quality and create new wildlife habitats. They incorporate parks and open spaces that act as natural buffers and utilize greenways and washes to extend wildlife corridors. <clears throat> the uh, Buckeye General Plan ensures that we balance these wildlife corridors and habitats and open space and recreation with uh, residential communities. So this is just a uh, stewardship portion out of our uh, general plan. And that blue line that um, that you can see, does my mouse show up in in uh, this as I go around the outside of? Yeah. Okay. Yes, good. It's there. It's good. There. So th that that blue line is our municipal planning area boundary, and inside of that blue line is 640 square miles of municipal planning area. Uh, the things that are, are included in, in this plan or depicted on this plan are the White Tink Mountains and Skyline Regional Park, uh, the wildlife corridors that come off of that, that are these uh, corridors in, in this yellow color. Um, there is the uh, Buckeye Hills Regional Park out this way, the Belmonts to the north, there's mountain ranges. And, and then of course the, um, the rivers and such that connect all of that. Uh, it's a, an, when you look at it from, from this angle, it's an incredible opportunity we have uh, to continue that, that, um, that network of corridors that move wildlife around. So you can see the opportunity for these wildlife corridors, not only to the mountains north and west, but consider the possibility of the corridors extending to the Hacienda, then south to the Gila, the El Rio. And there could possibly be a network of wildlife corridors as well as open space accessible within a very short drive or bike ride or hike from any location within the city. Additionally, the, the best practices guide shows the existing conditions and discusses the considerations to continue the migration of large mammals. These wildlife corridors generally follow existing terrain and washes with buffers on, on either side, as you can see in the slide here. And this is a uh, just another depiction of what that might look like. I think uh, this is straight out of that best, best practices guide, and it shows the the uh, widths that are necessary for some of the larger mammals that go through. But I, I think what I like about this even more is it's showing that growth and that development uh, that ends up coming in on, on either side of these corridors. And you have this beautiful wash and the buffer that, that's maintained on either side and the development is, is still happening on, on either side. I, I think that's a, a great representation of what we're trying to uh, make happen in the, in, uh, the Buckeye area. But well, my, my piano uh, work stopped there for a second. Um, this Buckeye continues to grow. We find ways to balance and enhance the ecosystem and attracting new businesses and residents to our city. Similar to our partnership with BLM for the Skyline Regional Park, Buckeyes applied to establish a similar agreement with BLM to preserve an additional 1,350 acres of open space now before development begins in the area. And that's what is shown here between the 1,030 and the 1,320, uh, sorry, the 320 acres. BLM is conducting the environmental assessment on that land and, and we're working through the process with them. So once we get the green light, we can move forward to open up more recreational opportunities for our residents in the West Valley. As we look to the future, we have our eye on additional 640. Oops, too quick. Piano is not working here. Uh, 640 acres, um, and that is adjacent to our Skyline Park, and that would bring the park's total uh, to over 9,300 acres. 
And this again help, uh, allows us to, to create additional access to our open spaces. We, um, we talk about it a lot at the city and we have this incredible opportunity to continue building Buckeye and the West Valley responsibly and focusing on our long-term future. The West Valley is on board with the plan to establish wildlife corridors and keep the white tanks wild. And this was a, a proclamation event that we did out at the uh, Skyline Park. Uh, and you had representation from the entire West Valley at this, uh, this event. And I think each one of them did their own proclamation uh, stating the exact same thing that uh, the city of Buckeye is saying, which is we want to make sure that we're keeping the white tanks wild. We have a, an incredible blank slate right now to build on, and we have really only one chance to get this right. Uh, if we end up like that first picture that I showed, a sea of tile roofs and no access to open space, no ability to keep wildlife moving from habitat to habitat, then, uh, then we've failed as a city if, if we don't have those things. Um, Buckeye and the city council are planning and building today the vision for a connected Buckeye moving forward. And thank you very much for the opportunity to present here. Great, Mayor Orsborn, thank you so much. Really appreciate. Uh, I think we do have a couple of questions forming, but what I'd like to do is allow Mayor Hall uh, to provide his presentation. And then what we'll do is after both mayors uh, present their vision for the future, we'll circle back and have a little round table uh, with each of them. So please allow me to introduce my friend, Mayor Skip Paul. It's nice to see you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor Hall was elected in August of 2020 also, uh, but has served on the city council prior to that and was elected uh, in, uh, 2008. Um, prior to that, his city service extended to the Planning and Zoning Commission. And professionally, uh, Skip Paul has a very impressive executive career in hospitality and uh, real estate, uh, even doing a stint in Japan at one time. Uh, he has been part of a United Council effort that helped pull surprise back to fiscal health over the last several years, generating a budget surplus and placing the city's fiscal house in order. He has big goals for the future as well, including a hundred year water plan, maintaining a strong public safety uh, with continued growth, working with transportation partners to expand east-west connections, developing a local circulator and expanding parks and recreation spaces for the citizens of Surprise. Like Mayor Orsborn, he's also steeped in a variety of leadership positions across the Valley, including Westmark, uh, Valley Metro, MAG Regional Council, the MAG Transportation Policy, and a whole host of others. Uh, but perhaps um, most importantly, Skip Paul is a Vietnam veteran and was awarded the Bronze Star for his outstanding service in 1969 and 1970. So Mayor Hall, let's just start right there. Thank you very much, not only for your service and surprise, but your service uh, to well, thank our country. Thank you, so, thank you, Todd. Yes, so and, take uh, it away, Mayor. Thank you very much. And uh, Eric, that was a great presentation. Thank you thank for you. your presentation. Thank um, you. <clears throat> as everyone knows, over the last decade, the Northwest Valley has been growing exponentially. There have been the sales of land, building of homes, but also needs for more parks and recreation to accommodate that growth. We have the White Tank Mountains in our backyards with fantastic wildlife because these mountains are still connected to the Sonoran Desert landscapes to the west and north. We have all witnessed what urbanization has done throughout the valley, which effectively has isolated urban preserves. It is extremely important to surprise that we honor and preserve the White Tank Mountains so our residents and visitors can continue to easily access it and this ecosystem can continue to thrive. Councilman Judd elaborated on some of it on the last series. Residents of Surprise understand the magnificent scenery the White Tank Mountains provide and its importance in sustaining a great quality of life. 
So if you could put up our general plan, Jamie. So how do we achieve those goals? As rapid growth continues, leaving its mark on the landscape, the surprise general plan 2035 encourages developments to be carefully designed and incorporate techniques that mitigate the negative impacts on these valuable natural areas and their view sheds. The general plan incorporates smooth transitions from developments of varying intensities and densities in order to provide a more natural edge with the White Tank Mountain Regional Park. The scenic lands development and the wildlife linkages corridor sub areas within the general plan ensure a more context sensitive development pattern around the natural resource areas. These sub areas combined with the encouragement of community trail linkages are key factors to the general plan's goal of maintaining a sustainable nexus between man-made development and natural areas. As we move forward, we need to solidify the corridors as a whole while supporting development and protecting the White Tank Mountains. In order to do this, we need to consciously avoid movement that can isolate access to the White Tank Mountains and harm wildlife habitat. We need to continue to enhance and further define what we established through our general plan, as well as our parks and recreational master plan. Could you please put that up, Jamie? That will include, likely include the expansion of our corridors to the north and northwest. The City of Surprise will continue to work closely with our regional partners as regional cooperation is vital to the success of protecting our natural areas and resources while enhancing their view, access, use, and enjoyment by residents. We as a city will coordinate our plan with these neighboring jurisdictions as well as Maricopa County so that we can collectively protect the corridors while providing full support to each other. And I share Todd's comments at the beginning that the economics of this work, we just need to convince the developers how it works because it works and Todd's absolutely right. So uh, thank you very much for letting me present and uh, I'll take questions. Great. Mayor Hall, thank you so much for your remarks this evening and for being here. Mayor Orsborn, uh, thank you again. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions and I'll just facilitate from the chat. The first one is just uh, um, kind of a logistical question. Uh, Mayor Orsborn, is the best practice guide available to the public? And uh, how do you get a copy? Uh, yes, it is. And um, that's a good question, Todd. <laughs> I'll, uh, I, can, I can share that. I think the, uh, the White Tank Mountain Conservancy might have a copy of that that uh, they can share out. Um, and I see Dana's- I'm getting ahead of yes, yeah, thank there. you. Okay, good. But uh, so that's probably the easiest, especially for the groups that are, uh, that are on here. Okay, that would be great. Yeah, so we'll make sure that we get that shared appropriately. Okay. And uh, so that actually came from Della, from Nancy, and it, I think it, it came up, Mayor Orsborn, when you were speaking, but Mayor Hall, you can certainly address this as well. And okay. it has to do with the process for development. Really, the, 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 do developers have to get permission uh, from the city? Uh, and if you're following along in the chat there, um, Nancy's asking about that, uh, to establish new development and the city then will guide developers to the location. So could you both just talk a little bit about, obviously it's a, it's, you know, a detailed process, but just a high level overview of, of how that works. Yeah, uh, so to an extent, in, in the case of, um, I was trying to get a, a map that shows the, uh, the area where there are already master plan communities that are um, entitled. <clears throat> and on the west side of the White Tick Mountains, north of I-10, uh, kind of that, that western edge or western half of Buckeye, there are 250,000 single family home lots that are already entitled. Um, so we can, we can guide them. Um, here, I'm going to I'm going to pull this up right now while I'm while I'm talking. 
um, and then share the screen so you can see the, the map that, uh, that I'm talking about here. Um, so we can, <clears throat> we can guide them to an extent. In some cases, they have uh, development rights that, that allow them to, to uh, come in and, um, and build. Here comes the share. Are you able to see that? Yes. Okay. So these these different um, colored uh, squares or, or rectangles or whatever they are here, the shapes are all uh, master plan communities that are already part of the. Uh, they're they're already entitled. So from down here in the um, the southern end, of course, here's I ten. You have uh, Sun Valley Parkway that runs up here. A lot of this is the Tartesso area. And, and then up in uh, number four is the Douglas Ranch area, which was just acquired by uh, the Howard Hughes Corporation. Up in the six area, that's the Festival Ranch, uh, along with 15 and 13. So a lot of this stuff is already really entitled and, and ready to go to uh, development. What we can do as a city is um, to try and help these best practices um, and, and the tools that we have within those best practices to make sure that we're keeping this open space open and we have these wildlife corridors that go through. So we're, we're a little bit limited in what we can do. Arizona is a real private property uh, rights heavy state and, um, and we definitely respect that, uh, but wanna work with the developers to create that special um, integration of both the development and the open spaces like Todd had talked about at the very beginning of this. Thanks, Mayor. Mayor Hall, anything to add on that from your perspective? Uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was good, Eric. I don't have a, I don't have a map of uh, our north and northwest part of Surprise, but we have many, we don't have 250,000 entitled lots, but we have many entitled lots. Yeah. And uh, we think we can accomplish that through open space credits yeah. and transfer of density, density bonuses for some developers. And uh, so I think uh, we're, we're in constant contact with those people right now discussing this exact subject. Yeah. And uh, I, I think we're gonna be able to accomplish it. And I'm, I'm confident. So uh, uh, Eric's got a little bigger task on his hands in Buckeye with 250,000, know, <laughs> wow. But, uh, but I think you're in surprise. We've got a great city council, we've got great city management and we're, we're, in total, we're in discussion with developers all the time. I mean, you know, Todd, you developed uh, Marley Park in Surprise, yeah. which is a beautiful community. And uh, we've, we've been in contact with uh, you guys all along because it's a CFD. And yeah. uh, so, but, uh, I, I think it gets back to uh, originally what Todd talked about was the economics and how it's self-interest. It's really a self-interest issue. I mean, we think, you know, environmental, being environmentally friendly is all, you know, hugging trees and whatever, but not really. Uh, it's about the future for our kids and our grandkids, that right. they can enjoy the, the animals and, and the park, like we, we enjoy it and we need to protect that. So. Uh, we're, we're, we're salespeople out there with the developers. And I just, I think it's a good sale. I really do. And uh, so. Yeah, and if I might just add a little bit to that, uh, you know, this is what I was mentioning in the opening remarks in terms of the increasing numbers of tools that we all have available to us. And as you, Mayor Orsborn and Mayor Hall were talking, I was saying about the tool of a conservation easement, for example, yeah. which is, is growing in traction for good reason. And it's a tool that DMB used in Barado to uh, conserve a huge uh, percentage of, of its uh, mountaintops using an easement. And you can still recreate uh, within that uh, easement. And so, um, again, another way to work in partnership with developers using a variety of tools uh, to help them meet their business objectives while maintaining uh, our interest in open space at, at the same time. Okay, we're gonna grab a couple more questions. And if we don't get to the questions right now, we'll just pepper these in because we do have some other 
uh, speakers um, this evening, but I wanted to uh, follow up with just one. Yes, so this is, um, it's back uh, on this kind of same topic of the best practice guide is development moves closer to the washes and wildlife corridors. Are there plans in place to keep the washes clear of trash, homeless, off-road vehicles? So there's a question about, you know, washes. Uh, and I, I don't know if, Dana, you're gonna get into that a little bit later. Should we pause on that or no? Um. I, I think it's reasonable to just say that a lot of the stewardship plans really are going to end up being developed down the road. Obviously, maybe this person is very aware of some of the challenges along the Gila River, for example. And those are very real challenges, um, but it seems reasonable that the plans to manage these areas, which don't exist yet, will come down the road as the stewardship um, over those is developed with partners. But managing um, the human impacts is definitely a part, an important and critical part of it to keep these areas um, as, as natural and um, as quality habitat for the species that we're trying to conserve. So I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Well, well, again, in, in the interest of making sure we allow uh, every, all of our speakers there a lot of time, I'm gonna move along on the agenda and we'll continue to sort of collate uh, these questions and, and make sure that you know, we're, we're getting to them. Uh, okay, so next up is, uh, and actually this is a good segue as we're talking about uh, washes. Next up is Mark Frago. Mark has been involved in project management, planning, hazard mitigation, and floodplain management with the Flood Control District of Maricopa County for the past 12 years. Prior to that, he served as a planner with Maricopa County Planning and Development Department for almost five years. Mark is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners and a certified floodplain manager. So again, perfect segue from, from washes to Mark Frago. So Mark, you're up. You need to unmute. Okay. Do we, are we seeing my screen here? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for uh, the introduction and uh, the time for the Flood Control District to provide some uh, information here. Um, as noted, I'm a project manager with the Flood Control District. And uh, one of the uh, areas that I'm a co-project manager on is the Sun Valley ADMP planning area. So this area is about 189 uh, square miles. Uh, it kind of looks like Idaho. I have another slide here uh, a little bit later, but uh, it encompasses the city of Buckeye and Surprise and unincorporated Maricopa County. Uh, as you can see, uh, over 56% of this land is owned uh, by uh, private entities and another quarter is owned by state land. Uh, it's mostly undeveloped. There is some existing development, but uh, as mentioned before from the mayor of Buckeye, there are uh, many uh, proposed development of master plan communities out here. Um, the hazard that flood control is looking at in this area are these alluvial fan uh, forms, as you can see along here. So right now, uh, in the area of the Sun Valley ADMP, uh, there are 12 master plan communities. And as he had mentioned that most of these have entitlements and the development agreements from uh, quite a few years ago. A lot of them do date back to around 2006, 2008 time. Um, right now the population in 2020 is estimated to about 18,000 people. And you can see in the next 20 years or in the next 10 years, it doubles from that and then doubles again. Uh, and these were MAG uh, projections. That's about uh, 164,000 people uh, completely built out. Uh, the existing developments right now, as mentioned before, are uh, Festival Ranch, uh, Tartesso and Sundance. 
and then these are some older subdivisions that are in unincorporated Maricopa County. The reason uh, this has uh, been brought up again as a priority for Maricopa County, uh, the flood control district, is that um, it, it, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, hazards uh, in here. Um, the last time this was studied was 2009, and uh, it, is, it, it rose to the top again on our prioritization list uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, we're using 2018 topographic mapping, uh, we're using the updated NOAA Atlas 14 rainfall, and then we're also using uh, Flow2D modeling. Uh, this allows for a better model for distrib distributive flow, which this is what alluvial fans do. Uh, it accounts for infiltration and uh, just a better model than the HEC-RAS model that was used uh, prior. Uh, as you can see, these yellow circles here, um, there are 21 alluvial fans where the numbers and the small dots are, you can't see. But uh, for lack of uh, time and money, there was, uh, we had to find a priority for certain of these fans. And what came out was um, that the development was uh, eminent in some of these areas, and also the spatial extent of the floodplains uh, for these uh, developments. Just a quick overview of the 21 alluvial fans, what an alluvial fan is, you can see this is looking uh, uh, east towards the uh, white tanks. So alluvial fans are large flood hazard areas uh, and they're, they're kind of, uh, the hazard is because it's an unconfined flow. The flow will flow out of the mountains, out of the white tanks, and it pretty much stays in a riverine portion until it reaches the fan apex. As this graphic shows from the fan apex, the flood, uh, the water, debris flow, sediment, uh, the flow plans can change, uh, not just storm to storm, but within the storm, depending on uh, sediment and debris flow that may come down out of the mountains. Um, the uncertainty, sediment and debris uh, result in these large floodplains, uh, and they're considered a high hazard zone. And some of them are actually uh, floodway. So in August of 2020, we had a stakeholder workshop envisioning um, half day meeting. Uh, this consisted of um, participants from various Maricopa County uh, departments, uh, the city of Buckeye, uh, numerous uh, developers, their representatives, home builders, um, Arizona Game and Fish, uh, Arizona State Land, and um, the White Tanks Mountain Conservancy. I can't forget that they were there. So the visioning summary came out. Um, basically, we needed to identify cost-effective solutions that reduce flood risks and incorporated multi-use functions. Uh, in doing so, uh, protection of the natural and beneficial functions of the desert washes um, to reduce runoff, sediment transport, and also to encourage wildlife movement. Uh, to do this, um, the alternatives uh, should be natural and have as little impact uh, to the environment as could be. And they should be sustainable solutions that require minimal maintenance. Uh, since these are alluvial fans, one of the uh, highest priority is the amount of sediment that comes through these washes. And they ultimately end up currently right now is in the numerous culverts that cross uh, under Sun Valley Parkway. Uh, we're trying to come up with solutions uh, that require minimal maintenance because after the developers build the properties, uh, the maintenance requirements usually fall to the city and or the HOAs. Uh, we wanna distribute the costs and benefits equitably, uh, achieve consensus with all stakeholders and uh, ensure that you know, the solutions are compatible with and don't negatively impact uh, any future transportation networks. After the meeting, uh, with some comment cards and just talking through the meeting, the project's uh, successes would be, as, and we're talking about the area drainage master plan, uh, would be the implementable solutions where we get buy-in from the community developers and elected officials. Uh, we like to call the win-win-win. Um, we would like to see some regional solutions that reduce flood risks and hazards. Um, right now, these developments are entitled. Um, for the developers to build, they would actually have to uh, account for the full flows of all these washes. Uh, that becomes redundant as if the first uh, home builder builds just east of Sun Valley Parkway, they have to um, 
ensure that the full um, flow coming through is accounted for, but also the next one would have to do that. So we're trying to get to a regional solution uh, to try to get uh, some of these developer and landowners to work together. Uh, once again, you know, cost effective that, you know, can try to integrate stormwater management and the multi benefits that come from that uh, back to the long term sustainability and really, you know, to have a clear understanding and what uh, the costs and benefits of these solutions. Uh, we're gonna have a little tough of a time right now. Um, there, there aren't a lot of constraints out in this area. And we thought that was a good thing when we started this about a year and a half, but we realized uh, anything's fair game. So it's taken us a while to come up with some uh, solutions on alternatives for some of the, uh, those eight areas of the washes that we're uh, looking at currently. So what are some of the things the flood control district is doing or proposing? So we could have a combination of structural and non-structural approach, what we like to call the hybrid approach. So really the way that this would be done would be to uh, mitigate the fan hazard at the fan apex. This could be done uh, new, different ways. It could be done uh, online or offline basins or some type of wall that uh, herds the water uh, as I showed the alluvial fan, it's very kind of varies where it goes. Uh, that's one of the um, structures that could be at the apex. Uh, we could redelineate the floodplain downstream within the structure. Some of the options for the washes uh, after the apex structure would be this middle photo to leave a natural wide floodplain with the path with no encroachment. Uh, we could slightly encroach if you look at the top photo here. Um, encroach somewhat into it, be elevated out of the floodplain, though leave the floodway open, or you could do more uh, traditional uh, measures, hard structural measures. Um, this is Rawhide Wash in Scottsdale where there's some flood walls going in here and uh, channelization to try to um, maintain the flow into in the uh, wash. So here, there's a lot here. Uh, this is more uh, as if like, they said I was, I'm a, I'm a planner by trade. So some of the more non-structural development solutions and some of these have been mentioned before is we could have uh, transfer of development rights, uh, some sending and receiving areas. Uh, one that's uh, the flood control district was looking at is obviously flood uh, plain preservation. This, uh, you know, we avoid building in the flood plain. It provides open space protection and community resiliency for these uh, subdivisions out there to let the water run where it has, uh, traditionally run. Uh, Multi-use basins, uh, these basins uh, imitate nature by retaining runoff, but also in the other 335 days out of the year, they could be served as uh, parks, open space, and wildlife habitat. Conservation-oriented development uh, was mentioned. Uh, this is a subdivision option that's better for flood control uh, and wildlife. Uh, trail buffering, I think, is, is something that could uh, definitely be uh, brought to fruition out here. Uh, this is an appropriate and effective method for preserving land and providing for recreational amenities along washes and floodplain areas. It promotes safety for the residents and also the natural environment. Uh, I already went through kind of what the structural and non-structural one is. And then lastly, uh, though not uh, a primary concern of the flood control district, if we can design some of these solutions with uh, to be able to show some of the landowners and developers out there that some of these corridors could stay a little wider, we could actually be able to use them for floodplain preservation. And also these corridors could be incorporated uh, into the development of natural areas and trails uh, to allow for the preservation and enhancement for key species movement which then also serves as buffers between development areas and the natural areas out in the white tanks. So some of the water conservation strategies that the flood control is doing, these are traditional strategies. Um, some of the things that we're looking at to implement would be spreading basins, um, injection wells, non-irrigated plant material. This would be uh, native trees that are actually grown in the nursery for three to five years here on our campus and then able to be planted uh, out at our structures to lessen the amount of water that was needed, additional water, and then also green inf infrastructure and LID uh, treatments. So these terms are kind of thrown around a lot. Uh, basically green infrastructure is just a, an array of products or practices that uh, use natural systems or an engineered system that mimics uh, natural processes. 
um, as you can see some from some of these photos here and the uh, diagram. Uh, low impact development is, uh, is a way to work with nature to manage stormwater as a uh, benefit. Uh, this goes towards uh, site drainage and using the stormwater as a resource. And some of the examples of GILID techniques uh, are bioretention systems, dry wells, pervious pavement, and as you can see, this is uh, curb cuts where the water from the uh, parking lot or wherever this is, it's actually used uh, to not all go down into the storm drain system, but actually used to um, water some plants that you have along in either your medians or uh, parking lots. Uh, this photo, this photo, this diagram here, um, and I'll have to give a shout out to uh, this alternative flood hazard mitigation measure. We actually also won an Arizona APA award uh, with this from our partners with uh, Logan Simpson and Stantec. Uh, this is a hypothetical area. Uh, it may look a lot like what you would be looking at in Sun Valley if you were looking at the uh, white tanks. So this kind of just shows all the different areas uh, that could be, or the techniques that could be used, uh, conservation easement uh, to allow uh, more dense uh, development away from uh, more important areas that could be washes. Uh, we could also have a subdivision that's conserv conservation oriented. Um, here's would be the floodplain is the blue line. So here would about be the apex. So we could get these trail buffers here and I was, uh, very interested to hear Todd was talking about the community in Colorado. Um, some of these, when these developments may have been approved, may have had some uh, multiple golf courses along the line. Uh, through our research and other areas, we have also found out that um, lot premiums for open spaces, if you have 100 to 300 feet behind uh, your next neighbor, are very valuable lots. And this is something that we're, we will try to show to the landowners and the home developers out there uh, that this can still work and you can still get the amount of homes you need. Uh, we can kind of get multiple use. Uh, we could have a, a wildlife underpass of the street that goes through here. And, you know, we want to make the developers whole. You know, there's the, obviously these master plan communities are entitled. So uh, there will have to be some give and take, as I showed, you know, over uh, Twenty-eight percent of this land is in floodplain, so something has to be done. It's just not like, uh, you know, uh, an empty uh, eighty acres somewhere out in Gilbert that you could just develop into a, a subdivision. So finally, I just like to give a parting thought. Um, we need to move away from thinking that natural systems can be in our communities and think about how we can embed our communities within these natural systems. And with that. I'll take any questions or comments um, that anyone may have. Uh, Mark, thank you so much. A lot of information. We do have one follow-up question. If you wouldn't mind uh, defining a fan apex again. The, the fan apex is where when the water runs uh, out of the mountains, it's kind of more of a riverine. Basically, it's in a confined uh, area. And as, the, as it goes down the uh, hill, especially if we'll talk about the Sun Valley area, it flattens out and the wash just spreads out uh, wherever it wants to. That's the distributive nature uh, of um, alluvial fans. That's how the flooding happens. It doesn't stay like in like the Hacienda or Gila River where it would stay in a defined corridor. That's only once it leaves uh, the mountaintop, let's just say, and we call that area the Piedmont as it goes down. And then that diagram I showed, once it, uh, Every one of these fans have an area where it just opens up wide and it looks like a fan. So that's why that's where the apex would be then. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. th thank you again, Mark. Uh, Tiffany, I wanna let you know that we're gonna get to your question, but I think that we're gonna go to Dana first because your question might make more sense following her presentation and then maybe Dana and or Mark can tag team on that. And uh, if you're not following along in the chat, Tiffany has a question about the relationship between humans and using corridors and, and what, what that means to animal populations. But uh, it, it, we'll come back to that uh, because I wanna make sure that uh, we give Dana proper time. And I think that question will be either answered in her uh, remarks or, or shortly thereafter. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dana Warnicke. Dana was with Arizona Game and Fish, a legend, if you will, in the department, uh, there for 21 years, uh, retired in 2019, 
and became a full-time volunteer with the Waiting Mountain <laughs> Service. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not too far uh, of a stretch. Uh, she has been just an absolute joy and asset uh, for our work, uh, inclusive of uh, the extraordinary uh, heavy lifting of the Story Map project. And so um, I won't go too uh, further along those lines, although I really want to, because I'm so grateful for your service, Dana. But I wanna tell you just a little bit more about her um, accolades. So she had a very intense focus at the department on wildlife linkage planning and the development of a Habamap, uh, in fact, Habamap, Arizona, uh, with emphasis on incorporating Western Maricopa County wildlife linkages into various regional development plans. She served as department lead on the development of the White Tank Mountain wildlife linkage design as well as the collaborative planning and implementation with various government and non-government stakeholders. Over her career, she's planned and managed several very high profile habitat restoration projects and uh, we'll put them in the chat. There's too many to list. Uh, her um, uh, uh, Vita is robust. A uh, couple of other things to point out though is Dana has authored popular articles and published technical papers related to pronghorn ecology as co-author and principal author. Dana currently resides in Pinal County near the Superstition Mountains with her husband and has lived in the East Valley since 1965. She is a proud grandmother of two and graduated also from ASU with a BS in environmental resources, cum laude, I might add, in 1995 with a minor in zoology. So to say that she's an expert on the topic is the understatement of the evening. So please join me in welcoming Dana. Dana. Thank you, Todd. That was very generous of you and thorough. <laughs> Well, it's my pleasure um, to bookend such wonderful speakers tonight um, with a little piece out of our story map collection. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and um, begin. And I, I'm going to apologize because I'm going to stop my video while I present because the interactive maps take a lot of bandwidth. So, with no further ado, I will share my screen. Well, I, I, I feel like everybody tonight has already stolen all of my thunder, which is wonderful. But with that, I will say, I would like to share our connectivity vision on behalf of the White Tank Mountain Conservancy to protect place and passage for people and wildlife. And we have um, an ecological imperative to keep the white tanks wild, as you know. Um, in the previous weeks, we explored many of the values of what makes these mountains worth conserving. And we learned a lot about the changing landscape for wildlife and people in the West Valley. And so tonight has been all about focusing on the future and the vision to keep this mountain wild. And it's really marvelous to hear um, how much support there is with our municipal partners and you know, um, the, the managers of the land, including the Flood Control District of Maricopa County. We want to grow and we want to have a healthy landscape. And conserving the natural heritage of, heritage of this place is, as you've heard, an economic opportunity and a quality of life opportunity. And we firmly believe that conservation and urban development can and should occur in tandem through shared education, visioning, and collaborative planning. The White Tank Mountains Conservancy and its many partners envision a regional system of connected natural habitats throughout the planned urban development areas, as, it, as you've heard um, already. Um, and so what I would like to do now is just step you through some conceptualizing, if you will, some interactive maps to get the wheels and cogs kind of turning about how this can happen, but also to, to kind of navigate some of the opportunity areas and some of the challenges. So we really begin by 
looking and identifying lands that already have various levels of management protection. And you can see on this map, um, hopefully you can see my cursor floating around, all these light green lands surrounding the two cities and the dark green areas, which are wilderness areas. These are federal lands, particularly BLM. And for the most part, we can expect that these are going to be protected lands despite their multiple uses over the future. And, and next we look at the Maricopa County Park system, of course. Um, and we have this wonderful um, set of two regional parks actually right here in the White Pink Mountains. So this is really where we begin. And then as you heard from both of our mayors um, this evening, we have these municipal plans for open space. And there's already a terrific framework that's beginning to evolve here. Um, there's, there's been a lot of work developing these plans and, and there's certainly um, a lot of opportunity just in these plans alone for connectivity. I also wanna step you through some places where we see opportunity. And as you learned earlier, the city of Surprise has already um, included wildlife corridors as a conservation element as part of their open space land use designation. And these areas shown in, in brown here are their corridor plan. And these, again, are essentially desert washes that are preserved in a natural state is the goal um, with, with buffers and with wildlife friendly development regulations um, adjacent to those buffers. So terrific opportunity. Um, the city of Buckeye, as you heard, has identified wildlife corridor study areas as an area where Buckeye intends to find opportunities to conserve wildlife corridors through partnerships. And one thing I, I'd like to note about their study area is that it includes um, lands that were predicted to be the biologically best for conserving wildlife movement between the White Tank Mountains and outlying areas. And this was one scientifically based method of habitat modeling for a suite of focal species, um, the most direct connection of the most suitable habitat for each of these focal species with the idea in the design process that um, you're also at the same time accommodating the needs of many other common desert dwellers. So that's, that's um, another um, piece of Buckeye's study area and another opportunity area, if you will, to focus on. And then of course, tonight we learned a lot about all of the floodplains that are out there and they are significant. Um, and these are FEMA and flood control district regulated floodways and floodplains. And as you heard, there, there may be opportunities for non-structural or semi-non-structural, if you will, um, designs that would certainly contribute greatly to connectivity solutions for this region. So we really see that the opportunity, oh, and, and excuse me, I'm gonna back up here. The other opportunity is to think about co-locating open space for wildlife with future plans for the city and county's multifunctional regional trail systems. And um, you know, these systems are planned to connect the white tanks to outlying areas and between the two cities and the two regional parks. And speaking to the one question um, that Tiffany had about um, how do you do this? Because we have research now that has been done over in the East Valley in the uh, McDowell Sonoran Preserve. We know that trails can impact wildlife use and effectively you know, reduce their um, efficacy, if you will, for wildlife movement. Um, because of different disturbance effects and such. So it's really important when we talk about co-locating open space um, for wildlife with these other purposes that we think very carefully about how to design those co-locations. And there's ways to do that by first starting with ample space for the biological needs of the species and, and then 
utilizing tools like buffers and landscaping and locating trails and such outside on the outside edges of these wildlife corridor areas and maybe doing things like not running your trail systems right down the middle of the open space um, and you know continuous and parallel to that open space but you know making direct crossings for example that are perpendicular um, to linear open space for example and there's a lot of other best practices um, related to design, such as lighting and how you maintain trash and all those things um, would go into a design phase for a corridor. And certainly the research that Tiffany um, referred to would help to inform greatly on specific species and what needs to be done. So we see this co-location of open space um, with all of these other opportunities as is maybe one of the keys and one of the, the primary solutions to making this happen. And so um, what I would like to really build now is a conceptual framework for a green infrastructure system, which really essentially is a cross boundary regional open space plan that benefits not only Buckeye and Surprise, but the region, the West Valley region as a whole. And there, there could be four main components to this system, this open space system. And the first one being desert wash corridors. The second being buffers. So if you add this idea of preserving a few, maybe not all of these on the map, but this is just a conceptual idea, but preserving some of these wash corridors um, with adequate buffers um, and adding that to the bigger picture there of the planned open space for each city and, and also the outlying natural lands that are in some level of federal protection you start to see um, a um, green infrastructure framework emerge from this. And then um, in addition to these wash corridors and buffers, this idea of adding wildlife corridors um, and wildlife corridors would be unique to some of these other um, components. Um, they need to be designed for the species um, that you want to um, preserve connectivity for, or you know, you're, you're wasting a lot of time and money and, and whatnot. So really need to be designed with the biology of the species in mind so that there's ample space and habitat quality for those species to seek food, shelter, mates, and travel between populations from the white tanks over to the other mountain ranges and such. And we're really talking about the biggest challenges being for some of the bigger species that we've talked about, such as mule deer, um, that require the greatest amounts of space. Um, there are likely multiple possible solutions to explore in the future with landowners and governments and citizen stakeholders. And I just want to throw out a few of those ideas for you. Um, one of them may be preserving a portion of the recommended linkage zone um, that Arizona Game and Fish designed. Another idea would be building on what Surprise has begun um, and continuing a swath of open space along the CAP between Surprise's linkage um, plans and open space, you know, over to the Hacienda River and the West Valley natural lands. So building on the work that has begun by surprise. A third option may be preserving floodplains. Well, I should say preserving floodways and floodplains and including in addition to those large buffers um, so that essentially you end up with ample space for the movement of some of our species like mule deer that require more space. And, and so these are, Three examples really of, of what we need to explore in the future um, to develop connectivity um, for wildlife and to really build on the plans that are already underway by both cities, um, as you heard tonight. So this is our conceptual framework 
um, it's just an example. It's not the solution. And I, I do want to mention the fourth kind of leg of a, a, a green infrastructure system that we see is hillside um, preservation and slopes, hillside or slope preservation. And you know that's something that both cities talk about, um, and it's a priority in in the general plans. And I just wanted to note that you know that's really important and critical too because. Essentially, what you're doing is you're preserving a large habitat block. And, and if this block shrinks to just what we see as the footprints of these parks, that will also have a, a impact on the carrying capacity of the wildlife population. So that is also an important conservation measure um, for this work ahead. So Solutions through collaboration. There's no other way to do this. As you heard today, we have a lot of um, master plan communities that are all already well entitled and on their way to um, implementing their plans. And this is really illustrating for you land ownership so that you can get a feel for what we're really talking about here. And as you can see, you know, around White Tank Mountains, we're talking about a whole lot of private land, which is the white. And we're talking about a lot of state trust lands, which are managed by the state land department. Um, and so developing partnerships is the only way that this can happen. Um, and, and the collaboration, of course, with our city partners and other land managers, such as um, the flood control district. So I just wanted to leave you with this conceptual idea of what we're talking about when we talk about functional connectivity and kind of building on what has already been um, initiated by both cities. And again, just to be really clear, we're, we do not insist that development and conservation are mutually exclusive. They, they absolutely can be accomplished together. And it's complex. And this is a very large scale initiative that's going to take a lot of time and, and work and brilliant ideas to make happen, but there's a whole lot of different solutions that can be cobbled together to make this work. Lots of different conservation tools. You heard about some of them tonight. And, and we just really believe firmly that preserving these connections will, will help conserve the natural heritage of this region. And it will be an economic opportunity and a qual quality of life opportunity for, for people. So um, thank you. And, and you can learn more about the connectivity vision and the collaborative approach and how you can get involved by once again going to our our story map and you can just scan this QR code to get there. So I will turn over my screen and, and go live. Dana, thank you so much uh, for your presentation uh, and all of your service over the years. Uh, we have a variety of questions forming, but uh, we're buttoned up against our time. So I'm gonna introduce our next speaker and we're gonna try to circle back to these questions at the end. So. Please join me in welcoming from Dig Studio, Jay Hicks, longtime friend. Jay, so nice to see you. Jay has been working in the uh, planning and design industry in both the public and private sectors for 37 years, 22 of which uh, include uh, Verado. So much of, what, much of the beauty that you see out there, uh, Jay is responsible for. He also did the Surprise Parks and Recreation Master Plan and is currently working with Maricopa County Parks on their strategic master plan, looking at 10, 20, and 50 year growth as a park system. Jay, welcome. All right, thank you. Well, let me see if I can get the, the slides up. So Dana's slides are a tough one to follow. So um, I'm gonna try to put a little bit of um, Call it a little bit of a reality check on, on this process. And so I was contacted probably about six months ago, or actually probably even less than that, probably about four months ago. I was asked to really come in and, and, and kind of help uh, look at sort of the issues on the West side. And I have a lot of experience in around this mountain. And also looking at strategic master plans has become sort of a, one of my specialties. And 
So one of the things that, you know, looking at this initially and, and what I'll go through in just a few minutes is sort of um, the next steps, the uh, kind of initiative, but it could even be called our strategic plan coming up for the next two years. But it really is recognizing that it takes both the public and private sector uh, being able to kind of meld together and make these things work. And it's really about being able to understand each, uh, everybody's entity, whether it's the public or whether it's the stakeholder, whether it's the government or councils or, or even uh, basically the planners, senior planners, understanding what their goals are, but also understanding their language. And I think that's always, a, you know, I saw in the chat, you know, what does pencil mean, pencil out? Well, if you're in the development business, we know exactly what that means just right off the hand is a pencil it out, does a pencil. And so, but there's all those different things that, you know, have that people come from different walks of life. And so the whole idea about kind of this kind of strategic approach is really about trying to build a common dialogue. And so when you have these discussions, you also start uh, forming shared values. And without it, you, you don't have those between them. And so this initiative that I'll be going through here in just a few minutes, um, is really about that, about how do we get the conservancy in a position to where, um, where they're able to really speak to not only the stakeholders, but also to the general public and also the council and other people that are interested in this. Uh, and oh, by the way, I need to, I need to call out to um, Mayor, uh, Mayor Hall, um, Surprise Park and Rec Master Plan won an honor award. I wanna make sure that you weren't left out today. It seemed like everybody else was winning awards on their stuff. So. But anyway, so going through uh, this initial piece is, and this really kind of builds on what Dana's talked about and a little bit how even Mark Prego even talked about uh, looking at alluvial fans about better data. So we are looking probably in the next six months or so engaging Arizona Game and Fish about doing a baseline biological, basically evaluation and recommendations on the true corridors. And it's been some time now since those corridors were even studied. And so the idea was we want to have really solid information by a third party outside of the conservancy. So we really had this, you know, from a science-based standpoint of what the best corridors are and what those really mean is, is really good corridors. Same time, we'll be running what we call a baseline evaluation. And this is really looking at each one of those corridors that Dana put up a few minutes ago on the physical and future land use around it, but also the physical attributes. So who owns them? Are they, are they entitled? Um, is it within a trust is it with a local family? I mean, those kind of things, we really want to understand who the underlying uh, landowners are. We also want to start looking even at state land standpoints. And I'll talk a little bit about that here in just a minute. But the other part too, is we know that even with this recent sale of, um, of basically Douglas Ranch now to Howard Hughes Properties. And by the way, I worked at, on Summerlin. So I know that client very well. I worked for those guys for about 10 years on Summerlin for uh, at being, basically being a part of my career. But so as we go through this, we know that we, not all of this is going to be linear, but it's some of it may be circular. <laughs> so we know that the stakeholder outreach may and it will need to go on from you know, this point forward. And so it's not so much of a linear process, but we do need to get a couple of these things accomplished within the January to August timeframe, which is really getting our homework done so we have really a good basis of information. At the same time, we want to start looking at developing a regional public outreach plan. And what this really accounts for is we about, uh, I would say we had about, see, probably about a month ago, we actually had, we invited Mayor Monrose, uh, uh, basically Mayor, previous Mayor Monrose of the city of Scottsdale, previous Mayor Mech, and Mayor Osborne all attend, uh, basically we got together for about an hour and a half dialogue to understand how Scottsdale actually achieved this norm preserve and saw all the aspects where it came through. And what was very evident at the end of the day, at the end of the basically that dialogue was really, it took an entire kind of group and it was outside the stakeholders and it was outside the, uh, the city, but it was literally the general public that actually made that happen because when you start doing that, there's this, this, this larger community. So when we start talking about develop a regional outreach plan, public outreach plan, we're really talking truly the West Valley. So this will expand beyond, you know, Buckeye will expand, you know, beyond the city of Surprise. And so this is one of the things we'll be looking at. And this is probably one of the biggest lifts. This is one that really is sort of a campaign to really understand. And it's really about educating people 
the general public, but also those that really value um, kind of the white tanks and also just basically open space overall, understand that these aren't just given, that these will be here forever, but there's a reason why we're coming to them on a particular reason, you know, to basically save certain areas or actually establish certain areas for corridors. At the same time, we'll have the information. And again, we're probably looking pretty specifically at the land acquisition and management strategies. The one person that's probably not on uh, presenting tonight is RJ Carden with Maricopa County Parks and also even BLM. Very, very critical partners in all this, along with state land, of being able to understand how these connections happen and knowing that even though a conservancy may be able to be successful on the corridors, who manages them? And there's a lot of things we'll be going through. So like I said, over the next year, a lot of these things are going to be fleshed out. Um, and then really year 2023, which I think is, if I can get it to go to the next slide here, is really implementation. And so we see this first year, this year coming up as a lot of homework to do. We really need to get our legs underneath it, understand all the entitlements that are out there, understand where the cities are at, and then start really developing a plan on how you move forward. And so part of the implementation, you know, basically the implementation plan of the outreach is really start working with Westmark and some of the other entities out here and start really rolling this thing out. Uh, also, we see the implementation kind of land acquisition and management strategy is uh, it may be private funding, it may be public funding, it may be some of the things that uh, Mayor Hall talked about was basically, you know, the density transfers or other kind of bonuses. I've always said that not all open spaces you know, created equal and some are more valuable than others. And so I think we really need to realize that, but also not discount things like bonding. Uh, I think that the city of Scottsdale is up to about $300 million in bonding. And I think I pay, I just saw my, uh, my taxes come through the other day and it was, I think I pay $117 for that. Well, that's a killer deal. So anyway, out of that, so again, you start putting in those kind of terms, it's less than probably even five or 10 bucks a month. It's a really good investment. So that's what we're getting ready to start on coming up, um, really starting tomorrow, moving forward. So, um, and I'll just open it up for questions afterwards. Jay, thank you. Thank yep. you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, we're going to use our final minute to stay on our program. I want to introduce you to Sydney Ashby, a very special guest to close out our program. But I also want to let you know there are several questions that have bubbled up that we haven't gotten to. So after Sydney closes out our program officially, we are going to stay on the line here. We do have the speakers available. And so we can hang out for a few minutes, go a little bit after class, if you will, uh, to get those questions answered. I also want to point out lots of links and resources being placed in the chat. So, uh, you know, find your way to the Conservancy or CASCA's website to stay connected and get your questions answered. But please join me in welcoming uh, Sydney. Sydney's a senior at Herbert or Young Scholars Academy at ASU West and part of a program called Poetry Out Loud. She has competed regionally and statewide and has recently been named a runner-up at the Arizona State Poetry Out Loud competition and has a wonderful way to close us out this evening. So Sydney, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and this poem is called Nature's Invocation. As we thrive and struggle through our daily lives, we put on a mask to disguise. Just underneath fly eyes sporting tearful cries, eroding cries, waiting to resign, yet sentenced to repression. A fundamental defense mechanism of humanity. But where lies our civility, our innate ability to protect, to provide reliability to those bearing the immutability of our actions, our faults undoubtedly projected onto our furry friends? foolishly pushing them to a forceful goodbye. Yet we think we are so wise, wise enough to rise above it all. No need to jeopardize our future when in my future, there are franchises with French fries on standby. Yet nature bears the back end of our demise. I'm left with only one question, why?
then again wondering why I brought us these white granite cliffs. Yet now it stiffs as 158 years of history are at stake. So we are not to wonder if, as time shifts, take one last big whiff of humanity and evaluate where you sit and where we can sit. Untarnished, indulgent, all prescribed conditions of man, nature present before we began, as we grew together, hand in hand. Now, in retrospect, what happened to the connection? Abandoned with no plan. Threats emerge every day for every creature who may not bear the same features as us. Nevertheless, they need a procedure in place that neither harms nor abandons their leisure in a world that's as much theirs as is ours. There's no more time left to disguise, only time left to reprise our love of wildlife in mountains oh so high. They've done enough complying to our inevitable demise. It's their turn to thrive, to fly like the cage bird once was denied, to untie their fragmented and isolated bonds alike as such the wind does as it brushes by like a predator in the night. For now, our future is bright as we reunite through the hope of inciting progress tonight. Thank you. Nice, okay, we'll do a, a hands up everybody. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Sydney, just spectacular. Uh, what a talent, we really appreciate you being uh, with us. Uh, before we close, uh, we do have a couple of outstanding questions. If you're not able to stay with us, we certainly understand, but we don't want to leave uh, too much of this uh, lingering. And then again, there's uh, links in the chat uh, to stay involved and stay connected. So if you didn't get your question answered uh, this evening, we'll make sure that we do so as a follow-up. I'll just sort of take them in the order that they came. Bob is asking about what role the Native American culture and or community has uh, in all of this. And I'll just open this. All these questions are now for all of our speakers unless uh, otherwise indicated. So does anyone have any thoughts on, uh, on Bob's important question about the Native American uh, communities? I'm gonna step in. And I'm gonna say, as the conservancy moves forward with the plans that they shared, the next steps, that the role is one of many, hopefully stakeholders, in my opinion. Dana, has there been, is, uh, is the region that we're talking about, does it impact uh, a Native American uh, community in, in any way? I'm not the expert that can answer that, but I would assume that there are connections just because of the cultural resources that we see in the photo behind you, Todd. Well, yeah, I, th yeah, yeah. I think there's one question would be about culture, which of mm -hmm. course, I mean, the, the petroglyphs and the Hohokam mm -hmm. and, and, and the history of the place. Uh, but as far as uh, tribal lands in particular, communities themselves. I, I don't think there's any within this region. Is that right, Mayor Orsborn and Mayor Hall? Yeah, I, uh, I don't know of any personally. My thought went toward the, the cultural resources and, and, yeah. um, and, and actually this being a, a um, I think a, it, it furthers the protection of those cultural resources because right. every piece of property that is developed out in uh, no different than Verado. So that, I, I think that's the petroglyphs off of the Lost Creek Trail right behind you, right? I believe it is, yeah. Yeah, and um, and so DMB had to do an exhaustive uh, analysis and survey of that entire Caterpillar property to determine what resources or what uh, cultural resources were there and um, and how they're going to protect it. So I think protecting these washes and corridors that generally would have been where um, uh, those those indigenous people were, I I think uh, um, you know it, it is it is all tying together. We're we're protecting the wildlife, but we're also protecting those cultural resources from from previous generations. Right. 
Uh, Mayors uh, Orsborn and Hall, while you have the mic, uh, Allison has a question for you both about dark skies. And if your uh, cities are involved in that in any way. Uh, no, we aren't. Um, we have a real strict lighting standard, but I wouldn't consider I wouldn't consider it dark sky. Um, I don't know that uh, we may take a look at that in the future for part of surprise, but uh, but in general we have sixty one thousand households in surprise and they're not subject to any dark skies. As as I guess you would, you would compare one city that comes to mind is Tucson. Tucson has dark skies. I don't know that our residents would able to be able to tolerate that. <laughs> I really want to be honest about it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, never say never. We we might look at it for a part of surprise. You know. Yeah. I I think from from Buckeye's perspective, all the new growth that is happening <clears throat> is under our uh, dark sky ordinance. Um, so I think there's different levels of of the dark sky. We follow. Uh, the and I'm, I'm not going to remember what it is off the top of my head, but um, there's there's certain best practices for for dark sky that we follow in the, the city of Buckeye, and I think most cities follow it. Where yeah. it's you know you're you're talking about lighting pointed down, right, right. shielded right. so that you can't see it from right. uh, a certain angle. Um, but I, I don't think any of us follow it to the extent that that Tucson does, like Mayor. Mayor Hall was saying. So uh, we definitely are looking at that and trying to make sure that we preserve those the, the views and, and we don't have the light pollution that, um, I mean, there was, there's was there been some really big discussions regarding that in, uh, in the community of Rado that I live in and some of these newer fixtures that are coming out that are LED, but a different type of light and it, and it shines brighter and affects circadian rhythms with, um, uh, with humans and and then has a an effect on the wildlife as well. So I, I think we're trying to uh, be mindful of all that as we move forward. Yep. Great, thank you. Uh, Mayor uh, Orsborn and Hall, Mike has a question for you. First of all, he wanted to thank you for uh, your presentation about the vision and sort of the macro level. And he's asking about I'm just summarizing for you, Mike, in the interest of time, if you don't mind. Uh, it, what, what is the best approach going? I mean, at the end of his, of his statement here is really a question about um, what's the most effective way uh, to, to, to steer developers towards uh, this? Is it, is it working directly with them? Is it sitting down with them? Or is it working more through civic leaders, such as we're doing today? No, that's fine. Well, I don't know. I don't know how Eric feels, but I think I think working directly with the developers and uh, and our staff is doing that in real time right now with a couple of developers, and uh, it's important. And, and as you pointed out, Todd, the economics work. If if you if you look at things a little differently in terms of premium lots, et cetera, uh, transfers of densities. We're, we're, we're talking to developers right now about that. And uh, so um, we haven't really got a really strong pushback from developers, as far as I know from our staff uh, and the developers I've talked to. Yeah, the, okay, they wanna protect the white tanks. How do they do that? They're interested. And I think this conservancy has really established a platform by which we can really bring all the stakeholders together and talk about the value of the white tag. And uh, that's what we're trying to do at the staff level with the developers. So I think it, it adds a lot of oomph to, to our whole speech for our sales pitch by having this organization put together, frankly. And, uh, uh, Mayor, that's very kind of you to share uh, on behalf of the board. Thank you for uh, for saying that, it it uh, it resonates with us because when we launched the conservancy, 
we admittedly said from the beginning, we don't know what the answers are, but we know what the questions are. Right. And they right. need to be raised. <laughs> exactly. and, and that's exactly what we're doing. And so thank you for recognizing that. Mayor Orsmore, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I would ditto everything that, that Mayor Hall just said. And uh, I, I, we think also the best way to go about it is to uh, go directly to the developers and the landowners and have that discussion with them. And uh, really, there's there's a couple of key pieces that we've been uh, kind of holding back waiting for so that we can go into them with a, um, a full quiver of, of arrows, and that's the best practices. So now we can, you know, speak about the different tools that we might have to help that happen, whether it's the density transfers or um, or it's figuring out somebody that that uh, perhaps wants to come in and, and purchase land for conservation, um, you know, all of the different things that are talked about there. And then also the uh, storyboard that White Tank Mountain uh, Conservancy had put together. And that really tells the story. And then you have the um, the toolbox that that you can bring along. Um, and then, and then the experts in the room to, to, uh, tell them, I, I can tell them all day long as a mayor, people don't believe mayors about anything. Right. <laughs> so you get the experts like the Jays and the Danas and the, right. the folks that have been there done that. And, um, and it's a, it's not a, uh, it's not a, we're going to come in and take your land or we're going to come in and, and really regulate what you're able to do, but it's a, a partnership that right. I think the cities are looking for to, right. Uh, create something that is so special that uh, you'll have people flocking to those communities to buy homes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I heard a song lyric recently that said, uh, I'm planting trees upon which I'll never climb, right. uh, which I thought was just really, you know, it's sort of a play on a, um, an old uh, saying, but, but uh, it struck me that a lot of what we're doing here is in the same regard. This is long-term. This is not something that happens uh, overnight. And we need not only all of you on, on the line today, but uh, you know, citizens across the region, uh, really for generations to come. Uh, this is something that will unfold over, this is not an exaggeration, you know, 50, dare I say even a hundred years. And so, uh, it really is an honor to be a part of all of that. We're long on time, so I am going to sort of end there. I do want to encourage all of you to stay involved. Make sure you go to the chat and click on the links that are being provided uh, for you. I think we got most of the questions answered. There's probably some lingering ones, uh, but if you stay connected, I promise we'll get you those answers. So please join me in thanking all of our presenters again uh, with a, a Zoom clap. <laughs> uh, and uh, of course, um, this could, you know, a lot of this can't be possible without the Pulliam Charitable Trust. So I want to recognize them again. Uh, Dana, one more time, and all the contributors to the story map and, and the speaker series upon which this is modeled. Uh, Anya from Kazka for your partnership. Uh, and, and again, stay involved. Uh, we need your time, your talent, your treasure. So find us uh, on our website. Uh, and also know that um, the session uh, was recorded this evening and will be available uh, pretty soon. Um, so with that, we're gonna wrap for the evening. Thank you all so much again for joining us uh, to our speakers. Thank you for your time uh, to those attending. We really appreciate uh, your interest in, in uh, the White Tank Mountains Connectivity Initiative. Have a Thank great you, evening. Have a good Thank night, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you.